Hi, folks, and welcome back to MMA Talking Heads. Now, I have a special attraction on this week's uh, version of MMA TH, the return of my original co-host and MMA journalist icon extraordinaire, Loretta Hunt. Loretta Hunt, how are you doing today? <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I don't think I'm an icon. So. <laughs> well, we like to, we like to give the, the top billing to all the, the heavy hitters we bring into the show, and you're certainly that. Um, uh, in addition to uh, a great exactly. asset uh, to the MMA journalism community, always reporting on the behind the scenes stuff. And now you've been doing a lot of good, uh, some journalistic digging and uh, fleshing the details out of this Eddie Alvarez situation with regards to Bellator and the UFC. Uh, kind of some quibblings and back and forth on this legal situation. So give us the give us the background on what's going on with Alvarez and and what happened on the the recent ruling and uh, where the situation is at now is the the fate of one of the game's most exciting lightweights uh, promotionally kind of hangs in the balance here. Yeah, well, definitely, I think at the moment Eddie Alvarez is the most coveted free agent of this moment. So it's important, and I think there are some other underlying themes as to why Bellator and which is essentially Viacom now, I, I don't think people are making that connection yet, mm -hmm. uh, but it's basically Viacom uh, versus Zufa, although Zufa is not involved in this lawsuit at this point. They've been very careful not to get involved in this lawsuit. So this past Friday was the first time after both sides handing in multiple documents. At this point, there's, I want to say over 50 to 60, 50 documents at this point, 40 to 50, uh, and they're really interesting because for the first time ever, right off the bat, Bellator put in Eddie Alvarez's UFC contract offer on paper from start to finish in one of the exhibits, and it's now out there, really? and it's the first time in a long time that I've been able to see a full UFC contract since it's gone through all these changes, so off the bat, this, this makes this a very interesting case to kind of just break down the contracts and look at what's going on. On Friday, they went to court for the first time, and basically, Eddie Alvarez had gotten a note from the UFC saying that they wanted to offer him a fight in March, but that deadline is, had passed, and now they were offering him a fight on April 27th, which was UFC 159, which is going to be the big one with Chael Sonnen and John Jones uh, in the light heavyweight uh, championship bout. And they offered Eddie Alvarez a main card bout. It didn't even say co-main event. We just knew it would be a main card bout, obviously, from what he's getting paid. He wouldn't be an undercard fighter. Sure. And the twist on this letter was they changed the – in his original UFC contract offer – that Bellator matched, it, the language was very vague in the pay-per-view area, the pay-per-view revenue area, but it was pretty clear that Eddie would only get pay-per-view revenue in championship bouts, either if he was challenging for a title or he became the winner. Mm -hmm. In the UFC letter, it said, okay, for your first UFC bout, even though it's not a title bout, we will still give you the pay-per-view revenue, which was key because now... Bellator has to have a pay-per-view. With the contract the way it was, the first offer, it was very vague, and Bellator could have totally argued, listen, this doesn't even see he's guaranteed a championship bout out of the gate. Plus, Dana White had come out a couple days after this all was starting to break and said, oh, no, no, Eddie Alvarez's contract never said he got a title bout out of the gate. So Bellator brought that into court on Friday. So uh, with this letter, though, it kind of skipped a step. And now Bellator just came out and said, listen, we're totally prepared to do a title shot. He's going to fight Michael Chandler, Chandler in a rematch, and it's going to be a pay-per-view. And we've got Viacom behind us. Viacom is behind more than a few million-dollar pay-per-view by boxing events. Right. Uh, talking about the Showtime family, all these entities that Viacom owns. And I'm sure there's some argument that Viacom has some muscle to kind of promote this, I mean, the, you know, they've got CBS, a uh, uh, broadcast television, at, you know, as a pot potential person to come in and and help uh, uh, promote this. So that was the case that was presented on Friday, and based on what Eddie's people put in front of them and what uh, Bellator slash Viacom put in front of the judge, he basically said, "Listen, I can't." Tell you can't ask me to say that Bellator's lying essentially and saying they're going to put on a pay per view when they're not. 
because that's what Eddie's guys were trying to, Eddie's lawyers, excuse me, were trying to argue is that sure. Bellator had never done a pay-per-view. They're full of it. But the judge says, listen, you can't, you can't do that. He goes, I do understand there's some differences between Fox and Spike. And, and where that comes in is because the UFC is con contract offered Eddie is clear that he'll get one bout on Fox network television. So when, uh, Spike rewrote the contract, essentially crossed out the UFC's name and uh, put in Bellator. They crossed out Fox Network Television because they don't have that, and they put in Spike. Mm -hmm. And that was another argument. So the judge's reaction to that was, listen, I do understand there are differences between Fox and Spike. It's cable. It's network. However, you guys have not given me enough evidence yet where I can, t I can confidently say that if you were to take this to trial, you would win on this point. It, it doesn't mean the door is closed for Eddie. Obviously, he can't do the UFC fight on April 27th because the UFC's already stipulated to him, you have to get some kind of injunction. Right. You, you know, you have to settle your case with Bellator because if Zufa gets involved and takes Eddie right now while this contract issue is set, still unresolved, uh, Bellator slash Viacom will sue them for torturous interference. Right. And Zufa's, this is what Zufa does every single time when there's a contract dispute. They tell the fighter, get it, get it cleared up, get yourself legally cleared, and then we'll, you know, if we're interested in you, we'll get a contract with you. So that's where we stand. I was watching Eddie Alvarez's Twitter last night, and more than a couple times he said, you know, I, I we'll do much better in trial, essentially. So it sounds like he wants to take this to trial. That's going to be a lot of money, and it's going to be months and months. Could be, I, I'm not kidding, it could be a year. Really? So what, what what are Alvarez's options now? I mean, what was the what was the takeaway from Friday? Is it is his well, option to go to trial or to just work it out or what? Because he could be on the shelf for a while. Yeah, the judge writ, had a like a two page written statement essentially saying why he wasn't going to offer the injunction. He also had a pessimistic outlook, I would say, from reading it that what Eddie's argument is at the moment would win in court. There's a lot of precedent. This is a looked at a sports athlete versus promotion contract dispute. And there's tons of them in boxing. He brought up the NHL. He brought up the NFL. Uh, so like that, those are the precedents that this judge is looking at. And based on all that, he said, listen, I don't think you guys have a really strong case. Alvarez? At the moment, yes. And, and that doesn't mean that, Eddie's not going to go into court and not win this case. Like right now, his lawyers have to go back. Um, I'm sure they realized there was a good chance they weren't going to win the injunction, though I think they did the best they could in the time they had. But now they need to go back and get some specific information. My guess would be some data showing how the UFC has this robust history in pay-per-view. And, you know, and there's no chance that even out of the gate with Bellator, with Viacom and all that, it's going to be as successful as... Eddie being a co-main event or a main event on a UFC pay-per-view. So what did they? So here's a question: couldn't, couldn't couldn't Alvarez just go ahead do the fight with Chandler? Mm -hmm. If he wins, does that have? Does he have the champion clause in his contract? Is he stuck with Bellator even more? If say he does this fight, goes back to Bellator and wins, is he kind of indentured to them for more fights, or can he do a yeah. one and done and be gone? Uh, both the contracts are eight fight contracts, lots of men. That's it. And if he does win back the championship fight, uh, the championship clause is is more like if you're at the end of your contract and you become the champion at the end of the contract, they can keep you for an extra year. So you can't sit out negotiation and just pop over somewhere else. Um, championship clause kind of comes in at the end of a fighter's contract. These are eight fight contracts. So at this moment, yeah, Eddie could drop this all and go back to Bellator Obviously, he said in public that that's not really what he wants to do. He wants to go to the UFC for various reasons. Mm -hmm. However, if he wants to take it to court, he's taking a promotion whose you know co-owner is a lawyer, a sports lawyer. Bjorn Rebney is a sports lawyer. Right. And, and they also have Patrick English out of New Jersey as their out-of-house lawyer. And he is Patrick, the yeah. expert on fighter... Uh, promotion disputes in boxing and a couple right. other sports. No, English, is, English has been a heavy hitter uh, between him and, uh, I think, Judd Burstein, two of the 
top litigators uh, from my years of covering boxing. So how many fights does Alvarez have left on his Bellator contract right now? Zero. Zero. Uh, but Bellator is saying, hey, we matched the offer. You're oh, now with okay. over again in a tape fights. Have you had any, you know, you've always been kind of privy to good inside sources, Loretta, and that's, uh, you know, a big part of how good uh, – reporting often happens whether it's on background or deep background or double secret Loretta Hunt background or whatever but what have people behind the scenes been telling you in terms of what how they think this is gonna play out uh, I you know what I'm almost afraid to answer that question because I'm gonna continue to cover this case and I do want to keep an open mind from from what I've learned just from covering contract disputes and MMA alone and there's been a couple that none of them have ever gone to trial, but they but lawsuits have been filed and injunctions, and so I've been to this step already. You really never can tell how a judge is going to interpret something. You know, judges are judges for a reason, and sometimes there isn't precedent, or sometimes there's something that's a little bit different, and the judge will hone in on that and and decide whatever they decide. So just because I'm going to keep covering the case, I really don't want people to think I'm leaning. I've made up my mind already. I'm open to either side uh, winning this thing. I do know if Eddie takes this court, it's going to be this long, drawn-out thing, and he's not going to fight for a year, maybe more, right. in my opinion. And, and, I, and, and there's not a lot of companies or people that have more money uh, than Viacom. Like They have more money in their legal defense fund than like most third-world countries, I think. So. Uh, Randy, and, and ironic, because Randy Couture took Zufa to court, right? They sued right. each other and Randy wanted to get out of his contract. And, you know, one of the reasons Randy said he eventually bowed out is he just didn't have the money. And Zufa right. did to go and go and go. Now we've got, uh, it's like I said, it's Eddie Alvarez versus uh, Bellator slash Viacom. It, Zufa's not involved in this. They're being very careful not to become right. defendants in this case. Um, by getting involved at all. And their letter was very clear. Don't come back to us until you have this all cleared up. We wish you the best. Love to have you, but get this all worked out first. If he had gotten the injunction on Friday, mm -hmm. Zufa could, could ha would have let him fight. Um, although, although that's, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe that wouldn't have been a guarantee. I don't know. Maybe Bellator would have gone right back in and, and said, no, we need an injunction and, <laughs> and block right. anything. Possible. At this point, Bellator didn't ask for injunction. They just said, don't give him an injunction. And they did that on purpose um, because they really didn't need to ask for an injunction. And they were very confident that the injunction was not going to be awarded to Alvarez. So what happens next? Is it basically Alvarez's move? or it, I mean, it basically hasn't been really resolved? Or what's the timeline well, for the next, next uh, development here on the plot then? I guess at this point, it depends on Alvarez. He has a couple decisions to make with his crew. Uh, his legal crew, he can take this to trial, which means the complaints are still in. We've got a complaint going uh, from Bellator to Eddie Alvarez, and then we've got a counter complaint going from Eddie to Bellator. They're suing each other at this point. Those are still active. This was just the preliminary first step uh, for to see if Eddie could fight right away. I mean, he was just pushing to see. He said it. He was setting a timeline and uh, a. a a date uh, in which they had to a judge had to make a decision because he wanted to show that all this legal stuff is um, impeding his ability to make a living. And ironically, the judge says, "I can't agree with that because mm -hmm. at any point you can go fight for the UFC." Basically, he said, "It's not my problem that the UFC needs an injunction from you for right. them to take." It. Right. And and that goes. No, and that's a, and that's a fine distinction, and that's you know what we hire judges to make these complex dishes well that's very interesting take i think uh we've all been enjoying your coverage at sports illustrated and folks if you want to find out more you can follow loretta at uh, twitter.com slash loretta hunt mma and uh, also we want to we're getting some reader questions and you can send those in uh to our twitter account at talking heads mma talking heads at twitter we had one question from a reader and this is actually germane to last night loretta a reader asking a question about the tripod rule uh, when a fighter but, has, you know, obviously both his feet are on, but you can't knee him to the head when one hand is touching the ground. We saw a bunch of this tripod stuff with uh, the John Dodson, Demetrius Johnson bow. Uh, what do you think of this rule? Is it a little bit kind of a little game people play? Is it necessary? 
Should we just open up the old Pride Days soccer kicks and wild animals against uh, three midgets? Whatever. I mean, is a tripod rule? Is it a sporting necessity, or is it kind of kind of ridiculous because you see the guy down there and then he puts his hand down, and you know it's like legal knee, not legal knee. What What do you think it is? Uh, well, first of all, let, let's um, let the reader in. This this is UFC on Fox Six that we're talking about, which took place last night on Fox. And by all accounts, I, I watched it without the sound on in a sushi joint down the street. It was great. Four fights, a lot of action. This championship bout uh, for the flyweights was fast and furious. Probably the two fastest guys in the UFC, right? Yeah, very fast. Yeah. Insanely. I, we had people watching next to us, and I just said, listen, I, I, I'm pretty sure these are the two fastest guys the UFC has under contract all together. Right. right. Uh, so we get to the later rounds, and... And Demetrius Johnson starts to implement trapping Dodson on the cage, which is smart. Dodson was very fast. He was hard to get his hands on in the beginning. And Dodson kept getting the better of the in-close exchanges and knocked him down a few times. Sure. So Johnson finds something that works. And, you know, he's manipulating with the tie plumb. He's basically uh, got his head. And along the cage, Deme uh, excuse me, John Dodson has his, he's on his feet. And his two souls are touching uh, the canvas, but then also his arm is intermittently coming up and putting it down again. And uh, Demetrius Johnson is kneeing him in the head uh, or, uh, when he believes that that arm is not down. So as soon as John Dodson puts the ha hand down, d uh, where Demetrius Johnson is looking at that moment, I don't believe he saw the hand down, and I don't think it was intentional. Here's the key. Right now, the rule is written as this. It is totally the referee's discretion. If they believe it's intentional, they take the point. Right. If they don't believe it's intentional, they don't take the point. Our referee last night in the fight was uh, Big John McCarthy. Uh, you know, obviously a disclaimer. I know John very well. I wrote his book with him. Right. But John and I have talked about a lot of these circumstances before. And What's that's his take kind on it? Oh, I haven't talked to John yet about it. I mean, I I just know John. John is, at this point, he can read a lot in the cage. And I'm sure he knew that Demetrius Johnson at this point had his head rested on Dodson's back and his vision was going straight out the cage. He right. wasn't looking down. Right. And I know this because John warned him. Um, Johnson figured out that Dodson was playing the hand game. The hand game. Your down opponent. Anything more than the soles of the feet touching the ground, down opponent. So he's standing, but he's down because his hand's touching there. Uh, when we saw it happen, uh, in a, I think in the next round, when, Do when Johnson got him in pretty much the same exact move, Johnson made the adjustment. He made sure his vision was looking down so he could see the arm. When the arm went down, he kneed him in the body. Right. And when the arm went up, he hit him in the head. So... Johnson's a very talented fighter, you know, and he made that adjustment very quickly. Personally, I don't think it was intentional. I just think he was kneeing and um, the way his vision was, he didn't see the arm go down when it did. Yeah, and you know, and I think that while we can kind of get caught up on, you know, should they allow them to knee or not, I think the important thing is, is a guy like Johnson makes the adjustment because if you got the other guy so helpless and tired out that his only, you know, his only respite is to put his hand down on the canvas – then knee him in the body. And another guy you know very well, Randy Couture, he's mm -hmm. one of the first people I remember in his fight against, I think it was Mike Van Arsdale from mm -hmm. North South position. He had uh, Arsville, you know, Van Arsdale in kind of a sort of a neck hold, lifted his knee up, and everybody thought, oh God, Randy's going to knee him in the head, and he needs him in the shoulder, in the body. Right. And that's a, if you've ever been kneed there, it does, it's not pleasant. I mean, it's not as bad as getting kneed in the head, but it's kind of an effective tactic. So, kind of interesting to see that work itself out and big props to big john yesterday because i really enjoyed how when the crowd starts booing or the crowd gets a little unsettled that doesn't even influence his decision i love that you know because you see a lot of refs on these smaller shows you know there's some extended cage work clinch work on the ground the crowd gets a little restless and the ref kind of like takes that as a cue big john doesn't never even pays attention to that he has his own internal clock it's honed after, you know, basically being kind of the pioneer of the sport and the modern rules. And I really appreciate that. I just always feel comfortable with him refing about. So there's one of our reader questions, folks. You see it right there. You ask it. 
uh, to our Twitter account at MMA Talking Heads, and Loretta provides you an answer. So thanks so much for uh, coming on the show. Again, Loretta, it's always good to get your insights. You can catch Loretta at twitter.com slash Loretta Hunt MMA for all things mixed martial arts related. And we'll see you on our next episode of Talking Heads.